Hi, my name is Michaelin Otis. I have been a friend of Carlin's for many, many years. I originally lived in White Bear Lake, Minnesota and owned a studio and, um, and classroom there where I taught for 18 years. I now live in Arizona where it's warm, which is really nice. I'm in a wonderful gallery. I no longer have to work terribly hard at the gallery like I did before. And now I just get to paint and have somebody else sell them. It's like I'm living in paradise. So I am going to do a demo today on painting on um, a different surface, a watercolor board surface. Um, I have really enjoyed being friends with Carlin for so many years. She's such an inspiration to all of us. Um, our, her friends are going to miss her dearly, um, but we all carry a piece of her with us, which is really, really wonderful for us. So this is a painting that I did yesterday up here in Washburn. And I wanted to show you the surface that I use because it is so different than what most people paint on. Instead of painting on watercolor paper, I paint on Strathmore Series 500 um, heavyweight watercolor board. And it comes in two different surfaces, plate and vellum. You do not want the plate unless you want it really staining. I use the vellum surface because it does not stain. I'm able to lift back to white and make many, many corrections. I also like that it stays so much more vibrant than traditional watercolor paper because the paint does not soak into the surface. So this is a painting that I did on the regular board without any treatment to it. What I'm going to demonstrate today is another method where I'm going to paint on a gessoed surface. Now to do this surface, I'm just like I'm picky about the surface I paint in, I'm picky about the gesso that I use. So I use Strathmore, or pardon me, that's the board. I use Grumbacher gesso. It's the thickest gesso on the market. When you put it on, it's more like applying plaster than it is gesso. What I like about it is I put it on with a plastic spoon. I smear it around a little bit. I only do about maybe this much at a time. Then I hit it with an old bristle brush and then I hit it with a comb and then I take a water paper spreader and I spread, I just very lightly go over to knock the big hills out so there aren't any little sharp pieces or anything that is thick enough that it could possibly crack. So this has my surface on it. I've already, I've already let it dry for 24 hours. And now I have done a pencil drawing of, oops, pardon me, of this sheep that I took a picture of him or her when I was on a painting trip to Scotland. I love the picture. Here's the original photograph. And so because of that, I've painted it several times because I just really like the lights and darks on this little sheep. I like to think it's a girl, but I honestly don't know. So I didn't check it out that close. So I am going, that's what I'm going to work on. Here's the original one that I did. This happens to be a Gicle print of that painting. Um, but it shows, it, you can really see the textures and the really glorious thing about this is you can lift all the way back to white where the gesso is on the board. Um, where I purposely leave little small holes and little pieces of the board showing through with no gesso because those are the little places where the paint does soak into the board and it will be darker than what appears on the gesso. It also makes it possible for you to, and you'll see later on as I demonstrate, it makes it possible for you to put a little water on it and dab it out and lift all the way back to white. And I'll show you that as, as we go on with the painting because that becomes really important ab about your edges. We all worry about soft and hard edges. Well, you can do the edges at the very end if you want because the gesso will lift back off so well. 
the only thing you want to avoid getting paint on is the white white where there could be little nooks and crannies there showing through to the board so I want to keep that this and his little face a stark white when I gesso boards I don't think about what I'm going to paint on them I usually do a whole bunch of them at once because it's very messy make sure you cover the floor if you're anything like me you will wind up wearing a lot of gesso and you don't really want it on your studio floor or your living room floor so that's why I do so many at once because then I don't have to worry about oh what should I paint on this one is there a blank spot there I don't even think about it so I really I like painting that way because I've even tried portraits on this and it works really really well and I don't worry anymore if there's a little dark spot in the middle of her face where the paint has soaked into the board um, I now have fallen in love with this texture that it makes and even portraits can be done this way so we are going to start our painting here put him aside you can see that I have drawn the sheep in pencil I have also kind of insinuated very lightly the, the background I don't know if I'm gonna stay with that design because I definitely want some whites going through him he's very um, vertical so I want some horizontals to break him up a little bit okay so um, I also use um, Holbein watercolor I happen to like how it stays uh, wetter in the palette and it's much easier to reconstitute I use very dark a lot of paint and um, I don't like to mess with the little dried up pieces that are floating around in there I want my paint to be um, really quite reconstitutable if that's a word you can see from my palette that they they still look damp and they're all dry um, and that's because there's something well actually it's a dispersant that Holbein doesn't put in their paint they feel a dispersant is the water in watercolor so they don't put any additives into their watercolor paint and I think that's one of the things I love about it you can really control how much it bleeds out um, because there there isn't an additive in there that makes it makes it going to makes it explode so that's why I like it it's easier to get your dark colors out into your palette without keep going back in the well and fishing for more paint so that's what I use I do use a few Daniel Smith colors I use uh, Quinacridone and burnt orange of Daniel Smith and a few miscellaneous others but mainly these are all Holbein watercolors and um, I actually have written a book called watercolor for the fun of it painting people published by North Light Books um, and I recommend all Holbein paint in that book so we are going to paint with that today and I'm going to start out with my sky I'm going to just quick check my photograph and I know that I want to start with blue in the sky I will put subsequent layers on this sky so I don't really have to worry where are the clouds going to be where do I want whites going through there because I can lift those out later so I'm going to start by simply starting with cerulean blue I always start even, no matter what kind of paper I use I always start with non-staining colors I you I learned that from Chenki Chi years ago he always puts a or at least he used to put a buffer coat of a non-staining color underneath as a as a undercoat for the painting so that subsequent colors will lift off and it's a really good trick to remember I'm sure you have all seen Chenkichi's big koi fish that he has in a big back dark background well he actually paints that whole background and then lifts those koi fish out with a thirsty brush the reason he can do that is he starts out with either cerulean blue or manganese blue both are very non-staining so we're gonna start with cerulean which is right here 
Let me bring a little out and get it nice and wet. I do return to the wells quite frequently because I use a lot of paint. I had an instructor years and years ago that told me to paint like I was rich. And I took that to heart and I paint like I could afford to have $30 worth of watercolor paint in my water. And I don't feel bad because I deserve it. So we're going to start with the cerulean. You could use cerulean blue, you could use any non-staining blue. And you'll see if I skip over that, what a wonderful texture that leaves there without me really even thinking about it. And if there's anything I like, it's not thinking. Too much anyway. So I'm going to lay the sky in. And I, I'm not really careful. A little bit. <laughs> but I um, add a little water here. I don't need to be a slave to where do I want lights, where do I want anything like that. Because I just want to get a partial feel of what color is going to be there. I can adjust it later or I can leave it like that depending on what I decide as the painting progresses. Now the first coat that I'm going to put on this foreground is raw sienna which is also a wonderful non-staining color. Um, yellow ochre is staining so if you want a nice non-staining yellow um, you want to go with with raw sienna. Um, I happen to like the color of Holbein raw sienna better than most any raw sienna I've ever used. It's a little more vibrant. Um, it is a little more yellow, less ochre than, I don't know if that's a word, but it is now, um, than many, many different brands. So we're going to, now I have penciled in, I'm sorry, I'll finish my sentence, um, we're going to continue down to where my first, where I know my first white is going to be. And I've got a line drawn across here. I don't know if you can see that pencil line, but that's where I'm going to start out leaving some whites because I do want white to dance through the painting. I also want it to join in the white that will be running up his left side because one of the composition tricks that I use is to use either white or dark to lead the viewer through the painting. Um, I always felt like some watercolor artists think that you shouldn't go all the way from white to black. Well, I went and saw, I went to the Rijks Museum and saw Rembrandt's work, and he went all the way from white, white to black, black. And I figured if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. So that's why I go all the way from white to just about flat black. You don't want it too dead, because I really like the fact that value will grab a viewer and lead them around your painting. Whether it's uh, black or white or a light, um, you really, it sounds terrible that you want to manipulate the viewer, but you really do. When you international shows, typically you only have about three to four seconds to grab the judge's attention as he's clicking through all the slides. And um, what is going to grab his attention? Well, if it's something that's very light, very little value change, they're going to skip right over it because they, there isn't anything to hold them there. So I lead them, I want them to look right at my center of interest because I want my darkest dark and my lightest light there to lead them there. And then I want their eye to travel through the painting. I don't want anything pointing to the next painting or they'll move right on to that one. So I really like to have white dancing through my painting. I always leave a little more white than I probably need because along the way it's really easy to lose those whites. So I want to keep my whites as large as possible at the very end, and you'll see that as I demonstrated this and, and prepared all my paintings for this lesson, when I get to the very end, I'm going to change the design because 
I didn't plan it out quite as well as I thought I did. And I don't like how many whites are there. So we're going to eliminate some of them. So right now I'm going to leave my white there. I'm going to come down to my grass area, which is right in here. And I'm just by skipping my brush, it just happens that there's some really nice streaks there. I must have hit it with a comb right there because it just automatically makes grass. And even if I go really dark on top of it, I can lift a lot of that back off. So that's going to be my grassy area in the back. I'll hit this side too. I'll make it lower over here because I kind of want it to be higher here. I don't want it to be just this dead angle all the way across. So there I've got some grass in. I'm going to leave another white right behind his legs because if you look at the photograph, he really does have a light path coming all the way up his leg and up into his face. And that's what's going to lead you there. So I want a white behind him in the area of his legs so that I can have places where he, the edges of his legs disappear. I really like there to be a lot of lost edges in my paintings where the viewer will fill in what that is because there's no line between. For instance, right here, this is going to be my white area. And after I lay in around that, I definitely want to go in and erase my pencil line that I put there originally between the leg and the white of the background. And I'll, I'll do that up here as well, because I want part of that to kind of bleed from him into the background and the same with his legs. The reason I'm doing some horizontal whites is because I want to counteract that harsh vertical that the dark in him creates. So hopefully at the end that's the way it will turn out. We will see. I'm going to use burnt sienna for the ground because it's another really non-staining color that I do not have to worry about if I want to lift some of it out. So here's my white spot. So I frequently put a finger where I'm painting um, to remind me because sometimes I'll get a brush full of paint and then I'll come back and think, where was I? Well, that way I know exactly where I was. I learned that from Shirley Bedient. She used to live in Forest Lake, wonderful artist. I think she still comes back and forth. If you ever see her name, you need to go see her work. Um, but I credit Shirley with that because, oops, oh yeah, that's right. I thought I lost my white already. Sometimes when I'm talking and painting at the same time, my brain shuts off a little bit which actually happens more often than I like to admit, but that's another story. Okay, so I'm going to paint this burnt sienna between his little white legs. And that's a leg and that's a leg, so it goes right here and right here. And I'm going to leave that white, and I'm going to go down to the ground and paint this in. I may leave another white down there by his feet. So I've got some white dancing through there. But already you can see that wonderful texture that's there. Now if I want to go back and soften that now, I can. But I am going to wait until the paint dries. Because if I soften it right now, and since this is a demo that I won't paint on again, if I soften this now, which I can, I'm still going to get kind of the ghost of that color there. Whereas if I run a brush over it once the paint is dry, it works much better. That's still a little damp up there, so I can't do it. But I'm going to switch now. Oh, wait, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to work on the sheep. Because he's in this gigantic hot background. He does have some cool up here, but I want to have more cool on him so that 
there isn't just this isolated blue in the middle of nowhere. So we're going to shade him first with straight cerulean blue. I want to make sure that it, it's clean in my palette because I do run colors together because I like to mix them. But I don't want this first initial coat to be muddied up with any other colors. So I know that this part around his neck is going to be white. So I'm going to paint my cerulean blue here. And I love the way the brush skips over that gesso. That way you can leave the painting as loose as you want, or at the end you can add many, many details and make it as tight as you want. I like to start out loose so that the decision is mine, whether I want to leave it really loose and juicy or if I want to really add a lot of detail. I will probably add most of the detail to his face because that's my center of interest. I know that it's right in the middle here, but luckily it's not here. I mean, optimally, I would want my center of interest here, 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 or here. I make an imaginary tic-tac-toe grid in my head, and then I decide where I want to have those. But knowing that information, I can also break the rules if I want and put them in the dead center and then try to make it work, which is a really fun challenge, actually. As I get closer to the ground, I want the ground to reflect. I usually um, try to reflect the sky in the top and then as it goes down it gets warmer and warmer because it's reflecting the ground. I don't know if it really does that in real life but I'm, I like to do that so. Okay we're gonna block in a little more because I know that I want some a little delineation around his little white face here. And this whole side of his face is going to be blue or dark. I'm going around his eye. I'm leaving a little white right here because I um, want the ability to add detail to his eye and also to make sure I remember where his jaw is so that it matches the other side. Now as I go up to his top knot, I want to turn warm. Oh, I think I'll use raw sienna. Because um, I do want him to look alive. If I put too much blue on him, he's going to appear as a deceased sheep, and I don't want to do that. I get to talking and I forget where my colors are. So I'm going to put a little warm up here on his head and in his ears because I just want him to look a little bit alive. So that's probably all I'm going to do for my first coat. I will let this get good and dry and then I will continue on. Typically if you're painting under a light and you work your way down to the bottom, by the time you get to the bottom this top will be dry. Um, it isn't for some reason, so I'm luckily through the magic of film, I happen to have paintings done up to this point. So here I am with one that is already dry. Now as you can see, I have added a little more blue to this one. Also, I was using my head a little better on this one because I've, I've got two shapes two white pieces coming across. And I really kind of like that. Um, for some reason, as I went on with this painting in my studio, um, I, and as you'll see later, I, I made this into two whites for some reason, and it looks too much like a railroad track. But we'll fix that on the next one. So any mistake I make on this one, it's still totally fixable because of the surface that I'm working on, because of the board and the gesso under there. So I'm gonna again start with the sky, and uh, this time I'm gonna add a little ultramarine blue to it, because I like to have the color variant as it goes across the top of my painting or any part of the painting. You never want to have two corners 
or, e or more looking exactly the same color and the same value because it gets really boring. Um, a judge in a competition will automatically look and make sure that the four corners do not match. And if they do, many times some judges will throw that right out. So I um, am going to add my ultramarine to change the basic hue or color of this side and then I'll just kind of go back into the cerulean as I come across. So we'll start with our ultramarine blue in Holbein. It's called ultramarine deep. They do have an ultramarine light in the Holbein, but to me it's the same color and you just need to add more water. <laughs> so here we're going to start with our ultramarine blue. Now you can see I'm kind of letting it skip around a little bit, but I want to leave it light on this corner. Now if I want to lift out some clouds, I, all I need to do is wet it, dab it off, and I've got instant clouds. And they look much more natural than they would if I try to paint around those clouds. So I typically will always lift my clouds out rather than paint around a nice white billowy cloud. It'll always have a dark outline around it and that's a dead giveaway that you have made a mistake in your painting, <laughs> at least it is to me. So now I'm gonna add some burnt sienna on top of my raw sienna here. I do want this part of the painting to be darker than this because I want that to recede back into the horizon line. I, you can see I never have an absolute stark horizon line in this type of painting. I mean, in ocean scenes and things like that, you do have to have one. So I would probably paint an ocean scene without the gesso. I would paint it on the smooth board. So we're going to add some burnt sienna to our prairie grasses. I took a picture of this guy or girl in North Dakota. So not being from there, I assume these are prairie grasses, but I really don't know. So I'm going to keep this quite light. I can always get darker, but the the spots in the where the gesso is not as you can see it's really easy to see here you can see all the little spots where that's where there is no gesso where that heavier color is you can really see it here and that was probably a comb that I used so that's why I want to you know make it textured like a background would but I don't want it too distinct because I want this to be really in the distance. Now I kind of like how the way this looks up here. So I think I'll just get a little darker here. I keep looking at the big picture as I'm painting and I apologize that these are all different ones that I've done in different stages because you can't do it exactly the same two times in a row. So I tried to do it the same, but it's you're going to be able to tell it's a different painting. And I do apologize for that. But when you're filming, it's much easier for both the photographer and the artist to do it in stages like this. If we had to sit around and wait for it to dry, he'd pro the, pro the photographer would probably get very, very bored. So I'm going to soften the edge of my white shape here. Now, accidentally, I left some white right in there, and I kind of like the way that dances up through there. So I think I will almost connect to that here. I use cloth diapers as my painting rags, uh, mainly because I was going broke buying paper towels, but also because I like to not deforest everything. So cloth diapers really work really well. They have no lint, 
so when you dab your brush on it it will suck the water out and leave the paint and you can hang them up to dry overnight and they're good to go the next day I don't really wash them until they're so until they're stiff if they're really stiff with paint then I wash a whole load you don't want to put fabric softener in there because that will that will change the texture of the diaper or the cloth so the old you know old diapers work really well I have found them occasionally at Sears still um, but they are pretty hard to find but I've got like two dozen so I'm set for life no matter how black they get I also use it here to dab my brush off now I see I can feel that this one's getting really wet I don't want to turn it over and ruin this texture but I may have to change that out in a little while because it's I've really had it suck a lot of water out of my brushes right here maybe I'll just switch ends here then hopefully I won't lay my arm in it we'll find out okay so I'm gonna keep going here and I may leave a lot of this I'm gonna soften my edge here because this is you know distant so I want it to you know fade off as it goes back there but have a little bit of texture to it now I want this to be kind of as white as it can be so I don't have any little spots there that are areas where the paint went through to the board now this still appears a little darker than that so I'm gonna add a little more to the start of this side so that it's it makes a good transition you don't want one color go behind to go behind the object and then come out a different color it will look like this is pasted on that's credited to Karen Knudsen who is also on this e-course she would always say it can't go behind a goat and come out a horse um, you know you have to think about the fact that this would continue on on this side of the painting so that's a Karen Knudsen nugget we've all been friends for so many years and painted together for so many years that and we all keep getting ideas from each other but I always like to give the person credit that either came up with the idea or heard it from somebody else before I did okay so I like that much better now because it's not the same color here and here but it does go behind the object and come out the other side basically the same color all right we're gonna work our way down I'm gonna paint this section as I get forward I want it to be darker so and warmer this this is really a little bit warm for being in this section of the painting but I can always glaze it later on and kill some of that we'll see the jury is out I don't make a lot of these decisions until the very very end while I'm working on it now I am going to mix a very very dark black mixture I use ultramarine, ultramarine blue deep from Holbein and I use um, Holbein burnt sienna what I like about that is you can see that I have a more blue pile and then it goes over here to a more brown pile the great thing about mixing your black is that you can then vary it have it be more warm or more cool depending on where you reach for in your palette so I want it to be really black that looks pretty good you know when you've mixed enough of the two colors together because it will appear not brown and not blue but black so I'm gonna put that in here and of course I can vary it as much as I want because this is ground 
I'm going to lean this more toward the burnt sienna. Put a little of that in there. But I want this to be a dark. I love how some of that blue shows through. It makes for a very interesting texture, very interesting shapes. Looks like there might be a duck sitting there, so we're going to remove him. But I have such control over my edges because of the gesso and the wonderful board that I use. Let's do the other side. Painting like you're rich means that you're going back into your wells of paint a lot. Um, I like to use more paint than water, which is a little atypical of a watercolor artist, but I happen to really enjoy dark, rich colors. We're going to get really dark by him. So I'm going to start over here so that it comes out behind him the same color. That's kind of nice. Need to get a little darker here because this, this and this don't really match very well. Got quite a puddle going over here. Get a little dark right there. But I don't want to have this exactly the same color as this. We're going to add a little on on the lamb, or I guess he's a grown-up, he's probably not a lamb anymore. Okay, soften this edge out here a little bit. Not too much because it's we're closer now, and some of the sunlight is going to hit some of the grasses. Hopefully the sun's shining, we don't really know. And it really, you can see here, this happens to be a spot that I think worked really well because the grasses are already there just because of the way the gesso was on the first coat of the painting. We're going to get one step darker on Mr. Sheep. I really should decide for sure if it's a girl or a boy and stick with one. <laughs> I don't know why, but... Okay, so I am going to start by, and I've got my photo reference right here. I'm going to start by darkening. I'm, I'm going to do his face at the very end. So I'm going to get darker right where I can see in the photo that it is really dark. He's got a piece of straw right there in his ear, but I'm going to eliminate that. I want to lean it more towards brown now. Let's start with a browner piece going through. I do want a little reflected light up here, but I can do that by lifting it out later. But I am, you can see I'm leaving a little white edge along there. Now I kind of like what happened right there. I totally meant that to happen. Ha ha. So we'll get a little darker as we go down here. I want to be a little browner down there. As we get down to the earth. And on and off through the painting, I may, oh, I just covered up that beautiful spot I had. <laughs> These things happen. We're going to put our raw sienna along the edge because here is his that nice little long hair under his little chin. And I want that to be white or very light. Okay. Um, a, when I lay colors on top of each other like this, for some reason, I don't know if it's the Holbein paint or if it's 
the gesso that keeps it from happening. There isn't a lot of mixing going on to make it look muddy. You can still see the original colors. Um, this, you know, is a dark, but I can see blue in it. I can see the raw sienna shining through, and I can see the dark brown and, and black. And I like that variation of colors. It's almost as if it does it for me. Now, as I say that, I just put a dot there and it mixed with the blue paint underneath and made some mud. So pretend you didn't see that. I'm just doing some dimension into that white area. And I can, I'm looking at the pattern on the photograph this kind of comes straight down. There's some of the raw sienna in here. And it actually, it has a lot of color out here. I have actually made it so that there isn't a lot in my rendition of this. We don't want to duplicate the photographer's work. We simply want to use it as a a pattern or an idea to work with. Okay, now I want to come down his legs. I see that I haven't done between his legs here, and um, so I should do that first so that I don't totally lose his legs into that background. So let's put a little raw sienna on these legs. Oh, so I did it backwards, just as I said <laughs> not to do. This technique keeps you from getting too picky because you can't. It won't let you. And I like that about it. I want to leave some lights on those legs. But I like to have a transition between the blue and the stark white of his little legs. He's got a cloven hoof right there. And this leg is a rear leg, so it's shorter. So I'm going to put his little cloven hoof parts up there. Now this is a space in between, and I see that I have there, oh, there isn't any space in between these two legs. Good, because I thought I'd made a big mistake there. So we'll put a little on this rear leg here. I didn't go quite down far enough for his little hoof, so I was able to lift it out and totally correct that. I'm going to use a smaller brush so that I can go in between those legs. Now I need to start with what I had there originally, which I started with the raw sienna and then the burnt sienna. So I'm going to put a little raw sienna, or oh, I have burnt, but I'll put a little bit of this in there because I wanted it to appear the same color as, as that does. You can see why my diapers get so disgusting looking because I dabbed them off so many times. So there's a little shadow right here on the leg. But first I'm going to fill in. I can see I need a little more brown. I, I can fill in in between there. I'm going to try to leave a little buffer between the background and with the edge of his fur there. And I can fix all this later, but I just, I'm putting it there so I don't forget that that's where it goes. Sometimes you get very enthralled with working on a painting, and then you get almost done with it, and you're missing a leg or you have five, which happens. Now, I also want to dark down here to set him down in those grasses. I always like to put something underneath him that will ground him. If he doesn't, if he isn't grounded somewhere, he's going to look like he's floating in the landscape, 
or he's going to look like you have a decal of a sheep that you just stuck in the middle. So I always try to make sure that some of my edges are lost, some of them are found, whether on the legs or anywhere else. Um, some of the color variation is there. And, but I can always go back and clean up the edges later. I am not worried at all about this edge right here. I know I want it to be some light reflected because there's always in a dark, you always have a little bit of light reflection to illuminate that edge. There's also something called the turning edge that I use a great deal. Any dark that you have coming through when you're on a rounded object, the area right between the light and dark will be the most dramatic color. I often put a totally non, a color that doesn't even go in the painting typically, right on that turning edge, especially on skin, because right on the edge of where it goes from shadow to light, there's always a a brighter color right there. And if you include that in a painting, it really adds to the life-like look that you want to go for. But I'm straying. So I'm going to put my dark under him to plant him on the ground. We'll start with burnt sienna. And this time I'm going to pay attention to the shape of his leg and pop it out more. So like there's his hoof right there. And now I've delineated it enough that it doesn't look like he's planted down under the ground. It looks like he's standing on it. So I'm going to go across. Make this a little bit of a dark shape. This is his back hoof back there. So I'm going to come here and, and make his little hoof. I can always blur it if I need to later, if I think I've delineated it too much. Ooh, and I like that little white edge there. Oh, but that's awfully long for his back leg. We better amputate a little here. Hope he doesn't mind. Okay. How much detail you put into any of this down here is totally up to you. You can get as precise as you want or as loose. I like the way it just so happened that the, if this is bluer here and it gets a little browner as it goes on, but I do want that brown to come out this side, so we'll pump this up a little bit. So it matches a little better. Okay, so now he's sitting on the ground. I do, I notice I have some raw sienna over here that isn't behind his legs. So we're going to put that in so it's a little more um, analogous as it comes across here. And I can soften this out. Okay, so I'm going to switch to the next one because this has to be totally dry, and of course it isn't, so we're going to switch. So now, as I spoke earlier about having too many horizontal lines here, um, this one I was so falling in love with what was happening here that I accidentally made two white areas coming through here. This, this one, and this one. And when you look at it, it's very linear now, and I don't really want it to look that way. So now I need to make a decision. As much as I love what happened here, do I like this piece better, or this piece? Or do I like them both well enough to try to make it cohesive? So while we're painting on the sheep, 
I'm going to be thinking about that, what, how I want to resolve the fact that I don't really like the composition right now. And the one that we're going to paint at the very, very end that is more done has that same problem. It has the two whites coming through that look very linear. So we're going to wait to solve that one on, on this, which will be our final one that we work on. So I'm not going to really work on the ground down here. I'm just going to really work on my sheep. I've got my nice blues in like we put on the other sheep. I really like the broken pattern in there, but I need to have my dark travel. Right now my dark starts here and it's going to go around and it kind of dead ends right here. I want the viewer to continue with this dark shape through the sheep and then kind of skip over to here. So that way I've got a, a backward C leading you through the painting. And then I'll connect it somehow down here, but I haven't totally decided that yet. But I know that I want this big dark shape here and to continue in the sheep so that you know that that dark is coming that direction. So that's what I'm aiming for here. So I'm actually going to start at the top of his head and work my way down, mainly because I will, if, if I do this first, I'm going to drag my sleeve down in it and ruin what I've already painted there. So I'm going to start with his face, and we're going to add a second coat. We want this one to be warmer and darker. You can put as many coats on this as you want as long as they're non-staining colors because non-staining colors mix very well together and it's actually difficult to get mud with them if you, as long as you don't have a staining color in the mix. If you have a staining color in the mix, then you want to really use only one staining color and a couple of transparents and then the color will look nice and fresh rather than like a black hole in your painting. So I'm going to do my next coat here on, on my sheep, which I did on the one that we just painted. I want some of these edges to be yellow or warm. And we'll get darker as we go across. Now, as you can see from the photograph, I like this little diamond shape that kind of goes in to him. So we'll put an edge on that here, and that'll pop out to you in just a minute as I get darker down here. A little bit here. He's kind of got, his neck kind of comes down here to divide those two areas. So I want those to both look like that that light, those two light areas. Now I'm going to work on his head. I'm going to introduce a small amount of carmine or alizarin crimson. It's the same color. I'm going to mix it with a little burnt sienna because I, his nose is really quite pink and I want it to appear that, that sweet pink color. So I've toned the, the alizarin down with my um, burnt and raw sienna so that it, I don't want him to look like he has red lipstick on. And I can soften the edges of that once it dries. But now I've got that color in there. I'm going to put a little in his ears. Now when the painting is totally done, I may look around, the, look at the painting from a distance and decide if that pink is standing out like a sore thumb. If it is, I'll add a little bit of it into my background. That way there isn't an isolated color that doesn't have any friends anywhere else in the painting. So I've got that pink laid in. One of the smallest brushes I use is a 10 or an 8. And because they come, brushes nowadays come to such a nice point 
that you don't really use a, need to use a teeny tiny brush. You just need to use the point of a of a decent brush. I will warn you that painting on gesso is very hard on your brushes. Do not use sable or, or you're going to take a $200 brush and wreck it in one painting. Uh, you want to use synthetic so that the bristles hold up, but it does wear them out more than a typical watercolor surface. Now I see a little bit of blue in those ears, kind of shining through. Maybe that's my imagination, but I'm going to put it in anyway because it's going to look like the sky is kind of coming through there. He's got a few little ridges in this ear that he doesn't have over there for some reason. The nice thing about this technique is you can always operate on him later. I'm going to start delineating his eyes. You can see, or maybe you can't, but I've got a pencil line there. And his little hairdo goes up here. I suppose he probably wouldn't like it if I call it a hairstyle. Comes out under the ear. We're going to go... It's quite white right around his eye. And on the sunshine part of his face, I want it to be the warm colors. And I want some of it to be stark white. Now I'm going to switch to Burnt Sienna and start getting a little bit darker, leaving some of those dead whites in there. And I probably will not soften a lot of those edges until it's totally dry. But I'm kind of using a dabbing motion so that it appears like his fur or wool, I guess it is, isn't it? Okay, this side of his face is much darker, so I'm going to use the ultramarine blue to put the first coat on that. If I can get a clear blue here, that's better. I do wind up with tons of paint on my palette, so sometimes it's hard to get a nice fresh color back. But And I'm not painting what I know a sheep looks like, because I don't really know exactly what they look like. I am painting the, the shapes that I see, not what I think is there. And that's one of the most important things when you're painting an animal or something. Anatomically, you want it to appear correct. And you may not know what the bone structure of a, a sheep's face is like. So paint the shapes that you actually see in your reference photo and it will it will work. Even though it sounds unlikely, it will work. We've got some straight burnt sienna here. And I'm going to get really dark right here, but I'll do it in two um, layers. I don't like how gray that looks, so I'm going to add some burnt sienna on top of that. That, that's better. He doesn't look so quite so stark. I'm going to soften those edges after that paint dries. So I want to start coming down beside his face here. I'm leaving my reflected light area there. You can see I, I do use a lot of paint, and um, I like bright, vivid colors. I don't, I like high key paintings, and but I, I prefer in my own style to make them much darker and more vibrant. It's just always appealed to me. It's good to try other people's styles but take from it what you like and leave the rest behind because you don't want to paint exactly like someone else paints, even though we all want to paint exactly like Carlin Holman. I'm sure she wouldn't appreciate it if all my paintings looked just like hers. 
And I know she's not with us anymore, but she is with me. <laughs> and with all the people that are here. She's been here with us, painting every day. I figure her classroom in the sky is already underway. Now I'm going to keep working my way down. I kind of like the way that color looks, so I'm going to leave that area alone and work my way down my little sheep here. I'm going back and forth between um, ultramarine blue and burnt sienna, but I do like little areas of the uh, cerulean blue th showing through. I want a little dark here. Coming down, let's get the other color, a little more ultramarine. I want some of it very dark. But you get the idea of what I'm doing here. If you find an area that you absolutely love, leave it alone. Um, but sometimes you have to sacrifice that area for the good of the whole painting, which is a little difficult to do, but you have to learn how to do it. Unfortunately, sometimes you have to sacrifice your favorite spot because it just doesn't work in the painting. That was one of the hardest things for me to learn was that, you know, if, if there's a spot that you love but it doesn't work, it's all for the good of the whole painting, not just that one spot that you fell in love with. I'm softening edges. And by doing that, I'm sculpting his face. I'm going to put his eye in there. I typically leave the eyes till last, but I want you to be able to see where his eye is. So I'm going to do it now. I'm going to start by, of all things that doesn't sound right, I'm going to start by painting his eye yellow, the raw sienna, because their, their eyes are quite light. Put a little edge there. So I'm looking at the shapes above his eye and I can see that little light triangle. Now right now I can see my pencil line there but once I'm through I'm going to go back with an eraser and try to take out all the pencil lines that I see. I do use a lot of pencil lines. I kind of use them a little bit maybe as a crutch. and But I don't like them really showing up a whole lot in the finished painting. So this is that little area around his eye. I'll soften that out. We'll paint his little eye yellow. I can feel that my elbow is getting very wet off that, my wet rag there. Now we'll soften out these lines. I just love that I'm able to soften before or after. Now how wet is that? A little bit wet. So we'll do the inside of his ears while we're waiting for that to dry. This ear, you can see a lot of sunlight through it, so I'm just going to do those what looks like veins in his ear or cartilage. And then I'll get a little bit darker. Because it really is quite dark in there, but the light areas really look transparent. Okay, I'm going to let that one dry. Let's do the other one. This one appears much simpler, I suppose, because it is in the shadowed side. It just really has a triangular light spot there. 
we want to make it look nice and deep. So I'm going to darken that a little bit. Really funny sitting here painting and feeling the wetness crawl up my arm. <laughs> Glad it's not something that's really crawling. Okay, let's finish his eyes and then we'll move on to the final one that we're going to finish. I'm going to outline them in dark. That's still a little wet in there. I think we'll finish it on the next one. I'll just soften this edge here. It's almost dry. This is why it probably is very hard on my brushes because I do splay the brushes out a little bit to lift what I want to lift. But to me, it makes such a pretty surface that I really like it. That's probably a little light, so we'll, I'm going to first add a little more blue, and then we'll add some brown. But I'm going to leave some of that showing through. Okay. Okay, now I think probably for if I was finishing this painting, I, I like this area really well, so I'd probably leave that and finish softening and work my way around, but I really want to finish one for you. So I'm going to switch to the next one here, the final one. Now, this one is nice and dry. You can see it still has my composition problem here, and I think I have found a way to resolve that. Let's try, here's my light coming through, and then it comes out here. But this gets very confusing, having both this shape and this shape in, in the composition. I should have done a value study before I started. I typically do. I didn't, and that's why I wound up with a problem down here. So I have to decide, do I want to keep this white stripe, or do I want to keep this one? Do I want to connect this white to this white somehow? How do I want to resolve this issue? Um, for some reason, it just looks very awkward to me. I really like this, the shape of this white. So I know I want to leave that. I like that this white goes up higher. So I know I want that white to be there. So what do I, where do I want my white? I think what I'm going to do, just made the decision, my white's going to come down and go through my sheep, come down to the leg, and come out down here. And I'm going to eliminate this white that's here, here, here. We'll see if that'll work. I believe it will, so hopefully I'm right. That brush is a little stiff. I must not have washed it out very well. You know, the amazing thing about watercolor is even if you don't wash your brushes out at night, which I don't recommend that you do that, um, but even if you don't, the next day you can wash them out completely just with water. I find that so nice. I do a lot of collages, and I'm not used to the fact that the matte medium, when you do a collage, ruins your brush, and if you leave it, and don't clean it, it's dead. So I'm going to soften this edge. Got rid of a little too much water. If you go to soften and it doesn't work, it's typically because you don't have enough moisture in the brush. But it makes such a nice edge there when you soften it once it's dry. We'll soften a few of these so you can see how that just softens that and makes it wool rather than just shapes. When the brush gets working, it needs more water. I know he's got those two light spots right there with a little dark coming down the middle. Voila, they're back. 
at this point I'm no longer really even looking at the picture. I want the painting to work as a painting. It's no longer, this is no longer my reference photo. Now what's important is right here in front of me. I never want to be a slave to the photograph. I don't want to just duplicate the photograph because anybody can do that. And that's the photographer that did the work on that, not me. And I want to make this painting my own. As you saw from the beginning when I did the other painting of this, it's totally different than this one. And and it doesn't look a whole lot like the photograph. It's simply that I used the photograph as a template that I knew, so I knew the shape of the sheep and what his legs looked like and all that kind of stuff. We'll soften this out. That's a little blue because I want that to reflect the sky, so I'll dab that out and put a little bit of cerulean in there just to reflect that sky a little bit more. I'm going to drag some of that dark in there. Now I've kind of lost my cerulean there, so I'm going to have to wait till it dries. I'm going to lift that back out so I can put a little bit of crisp blue in there and it will show. So we'll soften all these edges. I like some of the little little white areas skipping through. Looks more natural. So to me, I'll go back and er erase this pencil line because I've kind of changed the shape of him while I've been lifting the edges. And I like that shape. I think it's a little rounder, a little maybe healthier looking, I don't know. Here's where his neck comes down, so we'll put that in. We're going to soften his face. And you can see I have it shaded pretty much just like that last one. I just want the edges to be softer as it transitions from the dark side to the light. We want him to look woolly. Any um, subject that has a whole lot of texture to it is perfect for this technique. Because you can get such lovely textures. You don't want to paint a rose on this because it would wind up looking like a withered rose. If you're going to paint uh, any kind of flower on this, I would typically probably use, uh, do a hollyhock or something that has a lot of texture so that it doesn't um, look like a wrinkled rose. Now I've lost the top of his head there, so I'm going to lift a little bit of that back out just so I can see where his little head is. Work our way down. I like all that. And I'm just working my way down and seeing if there's anything that I really don't care for. You might do this totally different than I do, and that's fine too. We're going to finish his eyes before we work our way down and have everything wet down there. You can see why my brushes wear out because I lift probably almost as much as I put on. Hopefully not, but this is in the shadowed side. So now I'm going to go get my, my dark black here in a nice thick area. And I'm going to outline his actual eye here. But I want to leave a little bit of that yellow showing through because they really do have yellow eyes, surprisingly. Add a little bit of detail. I'm actually, I don't want this to be white, white. I want it to be blue. There 
there's a little diamond shaped light right there and as you see, it isn't stark white, but it does give shape to his face. I want it darker here. Now, I think that part of his face is done. I will typically walk across the room and look back at it, or I take a picture of it with my cell phone and look at it and by reducing it to that small size it you can really see if there's areas that don't work or that you're not crazy about i want that a little darker in that eye if we were closer to him i would put a lot more detail, but this far away, you really can't see the detail in his eyes, but you always want to leave, even at a distance, a little white fleck in there so that um, the eyes have life. If you don't have any kind of light reflected in there, it's going to appear like, like a whale eye almost, or a shark eye. Do I want to get a little darker around here? I think I do to give that a little more shape. I want his eyes to match a little bit. I want it to kind of have the same general shape that this eye does. So we'll kind of correct that. Okay, that looks like a giant eyeball. <laughs> Don't want that. So this part of him is just about done. Now I've got to let that eye dry so I can correct the shape a little bit, but that's okay. I like what's happening here. I need to correct this area. And as I said, I think I really like here and I kind of like it just kind of barely coming out over here. Let's take a flat brush and we're going to close the door here. It's cerulean there, so I'm going to put cerulean here and make it look like that color. It needs to be back here now. This is the point, too, where you can soften the edges of his legs and um, make them appear a better shape or whatever you want to do. We'll carry it through here. So now I've closed that passageway. We need to get darker there so that it, it doesn't get confusing So that I want because I want this dark to travel. We're almost done. So we'll bring this down here. Better take that across to here too. Okay, that little blue shape in there is fine. So now I have a white piece here and here. I've got a nice little bit of a reflection behind him. I don't particularly like this big shape here. So I think I want to have my white end about here. So let's fill this in. I've got a lot of burnt sienna in there. So we're just going to kill it. I'm looking at the shape of it and I don't want it to look like a giant worm crawling across my painting. A little more ultramarine blue. There. We'll plug that up. If you see any little spots you really like, keep them. Now, I would typically go across the room and look at this. Um, 
but I kind of like what's happening. I do think I need to darken a little bit here when I'm looking at it from a distance. Somehow that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Otherwise, it, the white was wanting to go over there, so I don't want to make this any wider because it'll look just like this side. So now maybe what we'll do is we'll finish it by bringing a little bit of dark down here so that my dark, you know, comes through here, goes all around, and then it'll kind of dump off the painting a little bit. But I don't want it to lead you off the painting, so I'm just going to do a little loose stuff here to, to change this side a little bit. Now I like that better. It looks a little more like a better composition. Um, I'm thinking too that I think I want to kill a little of this. This is where you can make or break a painting. You can really kill it at this point and overwork it, or you can just add enough to finish it, but you're not going to totally ruin the whole painting. So at this point, I think the painting is done. I'm going to call it done, leave it finished, but I like to set them up in my studio, and as I walk by, I'm seeing it in my peripheral vision, and if there's a mistake that I don't like or a glaring compositional error, that's when it will pop out at me. So I hope you enjoy trying to paint um, watercolor on gesso. I really love it myself. I love the textures and it's very, very forgiving. So I hope you paint it and happy painting.